Turn with me to Revelation chapter 16. We are going to continue in our series in the book of the Revelation, and today we're going to look at Revelation 16, the seven bold judgments. Hey, let me ask you a question before, before I, I read this to you. How many of you lost sleep and were deeply grieved uh, the night that the Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden? Anyone? No one was, you didn't lose sleep over it? It didn't grieve you when that man's life was, was taken? How about, how about when you're watching the news or you're reading the newspaper and you see the pictures of, you know, the, the top leaders of Al-Qaeda and you see that this one was killed in Afghanistan and this one was, was taken out in Pakistan and this one was taken out in Yemen, does it upset you? No. Why? Well, I just want you to, I just want you to keep that in mind. Just keep it in mind as, as we look today at, at Revelation chapter 16 because what you have is in Revelation 16 it is really a, a passage that describes a, a future event where God has just absolutely had it with evil and he pours out his wrath like no other time in, in all of history. It is the uh, seven bowls and I, I want you to, to keep this in mind as we read this. Uh, the people of the earth under really the leadership of Satan and following under the authority of the Antichrist and the religion of the false prophet, uh, evil has, has come to a pinnacle. You know, you know, Tony prayed before, there's a lot of evil in our world. Well compared to what it will be like during the seven-year tribulation period, it, it cannot compare. And evil will hit a, a pinnacle, unlike at any other time. And they will be murdering believers all throughout the world and having absolutely no mercy on believers during this time. So I just want you to, I just want you to keep that in mind as we read this passage because it, it comes, we come to a time where God just says enough enough and he destroys the evil and it is in the destruction of the evil and all that is evil that he then establishes his kingdom on earth so revelation chapter 16 verse 1 then i heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of god on the earth so the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them the blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the, four angels, uh, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain." And they blasphemed the God of heaven because their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates so that its water was dried up and so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he will walk naked and they see his shame." And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Harmageddon. 
Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell on men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great." Again, we reach a point where evil has reached its ultimate pinnacle. And this is when God, again, it, it, it is enough. Now, you have the seven bold judgments. Just to give you a quick review of the book of the Revelation. Remember chapter 1, John has the vision. He has the vision of the Lord. In chapters 2 and 3, we have the seven churches, which speaks of seven periods in church history. In chapters 4 and 5, we see a vision of heaven. And in the vision of heaven, the Lord takes a scroll and he begins to open the scroll. And the scroll is sealed with seven different seals. And with each opening of the seal comes another series of judgments. You have first the seal judgments. The seventh seal encompasses seven trumpets. And there are seven trumpet judgments that occur between chapters 8 and 9. And then... The seventh trumpet encompasses seven bowl judgments, which is what we have here in Revelation chapter 16. The seven bowl judgments occur rapidly. In fact, I believe these seven judgments could be occurring over the course of a matter of weeks, if not just maybe a month or two. The seal judgments occur over the course of the entire seven years. The trumpet judgments take place in the last three and a half years. And then you have, again, this rapid succession of judgments that occur at the end of the tribulation period. So you have seven different judgments that God brings upon the earth. Seven terrible judgments. So what we're going to do is I want to first take you through just an overview of the seven judgments. And then I'd like to talk to you about really some some awesome things that, that just shine from this passage of Revelation chapter 16. The first bowl is loathsome sores. And you see that there in verse 2. The word sore here in the Greek, the word is helkos, and what it means is an oozing sore. You ever get an oozing sore? An oozing sore is worse than a sore that's not oozing. It's inflamed. It's like the boils of, of Egypt. And notice who it comes upon. It comes upon those who had the mark of the beast and, and worship the Antichrist. Chapter 14, verse 9. Those who give allegiance to the Antichrist, who worship his image, who take the mark of the beast upon themselves. Okay, they will be the ones who receive these loathsome sores. And these, these are a people who have rejected, they've rejected the forgiveness, the grace, the love of God. The message has gone out to the world. It's been preached by 144,000 Jewish witnesses. Angels have been preaching to people during this time. The two witnesses in Jerusalem, they, they, they preach for three and a half years, and CNN and Fox News and the Internet is showing them to the, throughout the world as they preach the gospel. They have rejected the gospel. They don't want to have anything to do with God. They want nothing to do with Jesus. They follow Satan and worship Satan. They follow the Antichrist, and ultimately, ultimately they are murdering the believers who are throughout the earth. So what you have here... And I'm going to show you, because these, these judgments that occur in Revelation 16, it's payback time. These are those who have afflicted the believers. You know, they, they afflict, they, they, they beat them. They tortured them. And they murdered them. And we see that, we see that through, throughout the book of the Revelation. For, for John sees in heaven people from, from every tribe, from every nation... Who are these, John asks. And the angel says, these who are those who have come out of the great tribulation, these are those who were martyred during the tribulation period. And those who martyred them now 
God begins to inflict them as they inflicted the believers and, and opened up sores on the believers' bodies. So God now begins to pour out His wrath and His judgment upon them. The second bowl. The sea turns to blood. Uh, then the second angel, verse 3, poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. Like again, like one of the plagues that occurred in Egypt. And uh, this word here for sea, some people believe it means all the oceans and others believe it's a reference to the Mediterranean Sea, which is essentially the sea that the kingdom of the Antichrist uh, encircles. Uh, needless to say, whether it's the oceans or the Mediterranean Sea, uh, 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 some type of bacteria or something happens. And you know, some people believe this is red tide. Have you ever seen red tide? Red tide is occurring in the United States now. Red tide is um, it's a bacteria. It, it, it's, call, it's called a um, dinoflagellant. If you understand the English language, think of that, those words. Dino, it's dynamic. And it's flagellant. Do you know what flagellance is? I'm not going to go into detail here today. <laughs> Most of you know. But in other words, it, it's dynamically stinky. And what, what happens is, if you've, if you've ever been around Red Tide, we were down in North Carolina coming back, and in Maryland, one of the bays in Maryland got infli uh, afflicted with, with Red Tide. And basically, it just killed, it killed everything in the bay. Everything in the bay was dead. And it was red. The, you, when we drove over it, it was, it, it was red. Some people believe this is what it, it actually is referring to. But some type of, a, again, a judgment that occurs on the, uh, the oceans. The third bowl, a third bowl uh, affects the fresh waters. And the fresh waters are, are turned uh, to blood. The picture that I have I put up there, that's a picture of a lake in the Ukraine. And this is not dinoflatulence. They, they don't know what this is, but everything in the lake died. And the lake turned red. And uh, again, almost looking like some type of, of, of blood. Much like, again, I believe what, what, what happened in, in Egypt. Revelation, Revelation chapter 8 verse 11 tells us that there will be a judgment in the trumpet judgments on the fresh waters. And it says... One third of the fresh waters was turned to blood. Now here, it seems to be referencing that all the fresh waters will be turned to blood. Let me just uh, encourage you with something. If you are not a believer, and you don't want to be bothered with Jesus, you don't want to surrender your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would just encourage you that um, I believe we are, we are, and I'll talk to you more about this today, I believe that we are getting close to this time. I believe that the rapture of the church can happen any moment. I believe all the things in, in Scripture have been fulfilled for that to happen. But um, if you want nothing to do with Jesus, and um, you're going through the tribulation, one thing I would encourage you to do, start storing up on cases of Coke. Yeah, Coke, Coca-Cola. Because there's not going to be any water to drink. In fact, you know what? You could probably sell them. And I mean, a, a can of Coke. What does a can of Coke go for? A buck or two? I figure you can get $25,000 for a can of Coke when there's no water around. So it might... I'm joking, you know, and you guys are being very serious here. <laughs> Trying to throw a little humor into this today. But... Hey, Coke, it's the real thing. When you go into tribulation, you could tell people that. It's the real thing, man. God's wrath is the real thing. Verses 5 through 7, just notice this. You have a proclamation here about the righteous judgment of God. It is, it, is a, it is God's divine retribution. They have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. Therefore, it says here that essentially God is going to shed their blood. And uh, he's going to judge them. And again, God has the right to judge. We don't have the right to judge because we don't know all the facts. But God is just and he is righteous in the judgment that he brings. Let's look at the next one. The fourth bowl, men are scorched, verses 8 and 9. Then 
The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. You know what we've seen in these last years? We've seen solar flares. Just in the last couple of weeks, there was all this news all the stations on solar flares, and there were all these concerns about uh, solar flares affecting your computer, solar flares affecting your cell phone, solar flares affecting the power grid, and that there could be major outages. And some people think that the solar flares were what was responsible for 600 million people in India losing their electricity for a week. Did you know about that? 600 million people. You know, the sun, they say, is filled with helium. And if helium expands just slightly, it will affect the outer core of the sun, which is hydrogen, and it can release, again, these solar flares that come to Earth. I don't know if that's what God is doing here, but we're seeing some things that science is tell us and telling us about that make this, I mean, it makes it extreme, extremely, you know, plausible. In the, midst, in the midst of this judgment, again, it's saying here that these people will be scorched. Let me just tell you again. I'm giving you some good tips. I'm, I'm, I'm usually here, always trying to preach to the believers, but if there are some unbelievers here today, and you want nothing to do, you know, somebody dragged you here today, you don't want to be here, you want to get, if you're one of those people, I just want to say this to you again. Store up on Coke, and store up on suntan lotion. <laughs> don't go, though, for the UV 50. You need the UV 25 million. I mean, it's got to be like, like that, because this is, you're going to get burned. In the midst of all of this, what are they doing? Look at the passage. What are they doing? It says it three times. You think they'd be repenting. You think they'd be saying, oh Lord, God, forgive me. They blaspheme the name of God. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the Egyptians. One plague after another. You know, what are they, stunad? Aren't you getting it? One plague after another and Pharaoh just continues to harden his heart and harden his heart and harden his heart until God finally says, I'm going to harden your heart. There's no, there's no hope for you. It's kind of the same, the same situation with these people. And they blaspheme the Lord. Ever seen people like that, folks? I've seen people like that. I've been doing this thing for 30 years. I've, I've seen people just... Like one thing after another... They're constantly reaping what they're sowing. And it gets worse and worse and worse. And it's just like, when are you going to wake up? And they don't. The fifth bowl. The fifth bowl is darkness and pain. In verse 10, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Again, on the throne in the kingdom of the beast. And it became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of the, their pains and their sores and did not repent from their deeds. This is a judgment upon the kingdom of the Antichrist. We know from Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 17 that the kingdom of the Antichrist will be a revived, uh, revived Roman nations. Or the Roman Empire died in 440 A.D., Okay, it was kind of assimilated into the, the surrounding peoples. And for the last 1,600 years, Europe has been in chaos. Europe has, has just been, it's been one war after another in Europe. Look at World War I and World War II. You just look at, at the wars that were going on in Yugoslavia just a few years ago. But, but what has happened in Europe, Europe began to unify in the 1950s. We have today what is called the European community. It's in the news every day. The Euro, what's going on in Europe, what's going on in Greece, Spain, Portugal. And Europe has become unified in our time. And the scriptures tell us that from that revived Roman Empire will come ten nations. I'm going to go into detail about this next week. But that is where these judgments fall. The, the judgment falls upon the throne and the kingdom of the Antichrist. And it is darkness falls upon these ten nations. And people, people in the midst of this judgment, now think of this, they, they've, got, they've got open sores. They're living in darkness. They got no water to drink. They're being scorched. They were previously just scorched by the sun. And it says that they're gnawing their teeth. You know what that means? Gnawing their tongues. When people get in such serious pain, and maybe their legs hurting, maybe their hips hurting, Maybe their elbow is hurting. They'll bite down on their tongue and actually hurt their tongue to alleviate the rest of the pain in their body. 
that they will be gnawing on their tongues. But again, notice what it says. In the midst, in the midst of, of all these judgments, they are still blaspheming God. In Proverbs it says this, A man ruins his own life, and his heart rages against God. They have brought, they have brought judgment upon themselves, and they're still raging against the Lord. The sixth bowl, the Euphrates, is dried up, verse 12 through 16. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to a place called in Hebrew Armageddon, Armageddon. Now, I want you to, to notice this. The Euphrates River, Euphrates River is a river that basically, it's about, it's about 1,800 miles, starts up in Turkey on Mount Ararat, works itself down into the Persian Gulf or, or into the Arabian Sea. Uh, what the scriptures are saying that, that this great river will be dried up. And what's interesting is in Turkey, in uh, the 1970s and 80s, they built this massive dam. And really, at any time, they can basically close off the dam and flood out all the reservoirs and the lakes in the area and basically shut off the water flow in the uh, River Euphrates. I don't know how God's going to do it, if he's going to use the Turkish dam to do that, but somehow this dam is going to be, it's going to be dried up. Now, I, I want you to just to see this. It's dried up to prepare the way uh, of the kings of the, uh, of the east. How many of you remember when we were looking at Revelation chapter 9? We talked about an army that will come from the east. How many people are in that army? 200 million. 200 million. When John the Apostle wrote the book of the Revelation, there weren't 200 people on earth. And he predicts that at some time in the future, and some people say they're demons, I lean towards that being a demonically influenced army of human beings that come marching across the... Uh, the very continent of Asia, and they come across the Euphrates River down to Armageddon, down into uh, the, the Valley of Jezreel, the scriptures call it. And this army, again, of 200 million, in fact, it was in 1964 that Mao Zedong, who was the premier of China, said, and I quote, and I showed this to you in previous weeks, he quoted and he said that we can foot an army of 200 million men. And if you know anything about what's going on in China right now, the population is 1.2 million. And because of the one child law, when, when, children, when, when, a, when a child is, is born, if it is female, the child is usually exterminated. They, they don't have, uh, they have abortion, but they don't have abortion. Uh, a lot of people can't afford it, and a lot of people can't get to the cities to have abortions. So what happens is when they have a child, a, a female child in an agricultural society is useless, according to them. So what they do is they exterminate the child. And uh, they have an overpopulation right now of about 200 plus million men who don't have wives to marry. But uh, the potential for this to be, again, a, a Chinese army that comes marching across to Armageddon, it, it, it could be very likely. The scripture also tells us that the spirit, that there is these spirits, and it describes them as frog-like spirits, and I don't believe they are frogs. They are something that is unclean, something that is detestable, and they come from the mouth of the, uh, essentially here, it, it speaks about them basically flowing from the mouth of the false prophet and the Antichrist and Satan, and they're deceiving spirits, which perform signs of deception, and they gather armies from throughout the world to this place called Armageddon. Now, that's the Valley of Jezreel. That's Armageddon. Now, we've been there many times. I've spent, spent, uh, spent a few weeks there in the times that I've been uh, to Israel. And uh, it was Napoleon who, when looking at the plain of Jezreel, he said that all the armies of the earth could be gathered on this plain for a great war. The uh, plain is 120 miles long and about 20 miles wide. And it is on this place that the Bible says the armies will come from the east, from the north, from the south, and from the west, and they will gather together. 
I believe they come according to Daniel chapter 9, and Daniel goes into great detail to describe the battle. But Daniel describes these armies coming to make war with each other and ultimately to make war with Israel. It's during this time where, when the Lord returns that um, they turn their weapons from one another and they turn them on to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord destroys them. We can read about that in Revelation 19 in the next few weeks. A uh, little map there of Megiddo, it shows you, it, it basically goes like all the way from up here all the way down. It's, it's a massive plain. Again, it uh, gives us a, a clear view that it, it, it could be the place, that could be a place that basically could accommodate the, people, uh, the peoples of the earth. Just a... Uh, Again, a look here, you know, you have, you have Israel um, in here. And again, the armies come down from the north, they come from the east, they come from the west, and they come from the south. And they gather on the uh, Valley of Jezreel, uh, Armageddon, for this uh, final conflict, this final battle. In, in verse 15, I just want to show you one more thing here. Notice there, there's a, a blessing for he who watches. It reminds me of the, uh, the parable of the ten virgins. In Matthew chapter 25, remember, five of the virgins fell asleep. Five of the virgins were waiting for the bridegroom. And they kept, they kept their, their lanterns lit. And they kept oil in their lanterns. Beautiful picture of us making sure that we keep our light lit. And we keep ourselves filled with the Spirit. And then it, 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 the scripture says, and there's a blessing for those who keep his garments. What are the garments? There is only one thing a true Christian is ever clothed with. Not clothed with the church. We're not clothed with our own righteousness or self-righteousness. We're clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, it is to be clothed with Jesus. Scripture talks about being clothed with the Lord Jesus. And they, they are the ones who will be kept safe and be blessed uh, during this time. The final judgment, the seventh bowl, the earth is utterly shaken. The Word of God says in verse 17, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. A loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. <clears throat> And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, <clears throat> such a mighty and great earthquake as not occurred since men were on the earth. Now, the great city was divided into three parts and the cities and the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And then every island fled away and the mountains were not found and great hail from, from heaven upon men, great hailstones about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plagues of the plague of hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Notice just, again, a few things from the seventh, from the seventh bowl. It talks about a judgment upon the air. And I'm not so sure that it's talking about the atmosphere. Satan is called the prince and the power of the air. This is the dominion that Satan has over, over the uh, area around the earth. And I believe this is a judgment on Satan. Now think about what Satan has done. You know, look at mankind. Wars and world wars and one atrocity and genocide after another. And, and this again, this, this is his, his ending. Scripture says Satan will be bound. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. We'll get into that in a couple of weeks. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. And then the, the Scripture says it is done. Where did you ever hear that before? Right? Giginon, the, the Greek word. And it, it means that it is done, and it's in the perfect tense, which speaks about uh, it, it is done and it will remain done. And this, this is, this is the, the end. The curse is removed. The curse of death, the curse of sickness, the curse of Satan's dominion. It, it, is, it, it is removed. The lion will lie down with the lamb. The little child will put his hand into a viper's nest and the viper will treat him like a puppy treats a little child. It will be the, the, the end and a time of tremendous peace. The end of sickness, the end of disease. And the scripture goes on and it says there will be a great earthquake, a great seismos. And the word of God, it, it tells us that Jerusalem will actually experience a, a, a separation in its mountains. In fact, interesting about Jerusalem, Jerusalem is built, essentially there are three mountains, Mount of Olives, Mount Moriah, and Mount Zion, and it's built on three faults. These, are, these, are three, these valleys are actually three faults of which 
It is built on, and you know what, Zechariah gives us a, a great insight into this. In the book of Zechariah, I don't know if you can see that, but it's Zechariah chapter 14, verses 2 through 4. The Word of God says this, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. So this is, again, Armageddon. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountains moving north and half moving south. It comes this, this great... It's like, the Lord's touchdown, when his foot touches, bang, comes this, this massive earthquake. So Jerusalem here is divided into three parts. Scripture says, the cities and the nations fell. Word of God tells us that the islands will be fled away, will, will be, essentially they, they will flee away. The mountains will be leveled. Do you know what you see God doing here? He's bringing everything back to Genesis 2. And this is part of the recreation. Understand, the tribulation period, you got wars. You got nuclear bombs going off. You got, back, you got chemical weapons being released. You got biological weapons being released. Satan's having a heyday, or it seems. And you got God coming and the angels coming and bringing judgment. And you know what? The, wor the world is going to be a mess and God's starting to clean it up. God's going to remake this thing. And that's what he does going into his kingdom. He, he remakes it. And ultimately... He makes a totally new heaven and new earth uh, after a 1,000 year period called the millennial period. If you're new to this, you will understand it as we go through in continuous weeks. It tells us that the islands fled away and then it tells us that hail fell and that it was of the weight of a talent. How much does a talent weigh? A hundred pounds. Here's the biggest, this is the biggest hailstone ever recorded and it measures about 19 inches. Imagine a hailstone that's 100 pounds. You know what people are going to be saying during that time? You know what they're going to be saying? What the hell is going on? <laughs> hey, I hope you understood what I just said. Those of you who are really holy years, so don't send me emails. I said hail. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. I prayed about it. The Lord said, make sure you say hail. And they still blaspheme God. They still blaspheme God. Hey, I want to I wrap this up. You know what this, this passage is? You know when you were a little kid and your mom, she had a, maybe it was like hamburger or something that you really loved to eat, but she said you had to eat your vegetables before. And this passage is like you have to eat your vegetables before. And it's, it's a tough passage. It's just, it's, it's God's holy and righteous anger. Now, I want to share with you some joyful things. One thing is, in the midst of all of this, you know there are believers on the earth. Because apparently there are a whole lot of believers who are left standing to go into the kingdom of God. And they haven't died. They haven't been martyred. They haven't been killed. And God, during this time, protects them. He, he, he protects them from the judgments that are going on around them. You know what it reminds me of? Psalm 91, one of my favorite psalms, verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. We are not guaranteed. We are not guaranteed uh, divine protection in this life at this time. You see Christians, all right, with brothers and sisters who are being martyred. We have a brother from Nigeria. They're, they're just burning and blowing up the churches on a regular basis. Our brothers are being killed in, in Egypt right now, in the, in the Islamic countries. In fact, there are many countries, I don't think you could find too many believers. They've already been exterminated. China, many of our brothers and sisters are locked up in prison. Indonesia, Christians come under persecution on a, on a daily basis. Like a number of years ago, a few years ago, there was a day they, they, called, they, called, they called it the... The day of vengeance, it was a Sunday where the Muslim extremists just went into the churches and they began to kill Christians. And they actually went to one church and it was a pastor in the Assemblies of God. And in front of his congregation, they cut off both of his arms. Eventually he died. 
But our, our, our brothers and sisters throughout the world, here we are, you know, we live in America, and thank God for the Constitution and police and everything else, we're still free to be able to worship the way we are. But God doesn't, God doesn't guarantee, and I believe, look, if God calls a person to die for him, and I think a lot of people who he calls to die for him take it as a great privilege and an honor. I think he gives them the grace. And I believe that's true of every martyr who's died through the last 2,000 years of church history. But one thing, one thing that God does promise us, he does promise us protection from the enemy. And he promises protection of our souls. I just want to show you something. This is a, a great picture of, of a, a, depicting a believer during the tribulation. Notice he has the armor of God on. Do you see the, you see the, the claw coming down? There's the claws of the enemy, and there's the disciples of the Antichrist. And uh, I just noticed he has everything on except for the helmet of salvation. He's holding it down somewhere. But he's got the, uh, you know, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, and I'm sure on his feet are the, the peace of God. And uh, the word of God tells us in John chapter 1, 1 John chapter, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 5 verse 18, that Satan can't get his claws into a believer. That's a wonderful blessing. That he was born of God. That Satan can't get his claws into them. Now he may tempt you. He can deceive you. But he can't get control of you. And that, that's a wonderful blessing of, of divine protection, I believe, in the time that we live in. Uh, another, another thing that stands out in this passage, again, with all the signs and wonders, with all the shock and awe, you know, you would, you would think, I mean, there, there's stuff going on, and they clearly know that this is God at this time. God, God, is, God is pouring out His wrath, and there are judgments going on all around them. And again, they, they still refuse to believe, and they're still re, uh, blaspheming God and, and refuse to repent. And there's a word that Jesus gives us in Luke chapter 16, 31. It says this, If they won't believe the word, they won't believe if someone rises from the dead. You know what that, that means? If people reject the word, it don't matter how many miracles, it don't matter how many signs, it don't matter how many wonders are going on. If people will not believe the word of God, during this time there were 144,000 witnesses, imagine 144,000 Apostle Pauls let loose on the world, preaching the gospel to the world. There are two witnesses who are preaching the gospel in Jerusalem for three and a half years that's being covered, again, by all the major stations. They're proclaiming and they're doing miracles. And the angels are actually flying through the sky preaching the gospel. And they, re they, reject, they reject the word of God and all the signs and wonders. It doesn't make a difference. If you do not receive the word of God, it don't matter how many miracles God does, you won't believe. This is the greatest gift we have that has been given to us, that we can hold, that we can possess physically, is the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And they refuse to hear. So all the other stuff, it, it, it don't matter. You have people like that? People say, well, you know what? Well, if, 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 if God could do a miracle, if I, if I could see this, if I could see... No, you know what? I look at them and I say, no, you still won't believe. You won't believe! If you don't believe the Word... You're going to believe that? The Word of God will get to your heart faster than any miracle ever will. Amen. That's not to say there isn't a place for miracles. Third thing I want you to notice. The chessboard is set. Just when we look at the Scriptures, you look at the book of the Revelation, you look at all the prophetic passages, and I said this at the beginning of the message, God has set the chessboard. The game's ready to be played. People, what else has to happen? Well, you know, just one of the sisters in the church handed me an article a couple of months ago, and it was basically a, a writer in one of the local papers mocking people who believe in the book of the Revelation. And mocking and saying, well, you know, these people have been talking about this for the last 30 years, and, and nothing's happening. I'm like, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Are you kidding me? There's never been a time like this in history. There, there's never been a time in history... Think about this. There's never been a time in history where mankind has the power to destroy half of the Earth's population in a matter of a day or two. With all of the nukes, 
with all of the biological weapons and chemical weapons, not only do we have the power to kill half of mankind, which is what the scripture says will happen during this time, we have the power to kill mankind 30 times over and burn the earth, burn the earth to a cinder 30 times over with nuclear weapons. There's about 30,000 of them on the, on the face of the earth. There has never been a time in all of history where man has that type of power, man has that type of potential. There has never been a time in history where all ma of mankind can watch a momentary event. Remember 9-11? Well, the people in China and the people in Australia and the people in Russia and the people in South America and all over North America and all over Europe and all over Africa were watching those buildings crumble simultaneously in the same moment. Never has there been a time, and Revelation chapter 9 tells us that the two witnesses who will be killed, that everyone on the earth of all tribes and nations and peoples will watch that single event. And there has never been a time in history like that. There has never been a time in history where the people of the earth, a nation, can foot an army of 200 million soldiers. And that is what it tells us in Revelation chapter 9. There has never been a time since the fall of the Roman Empire in 440 A.D. where Europe is united. And the European nations, which again were at war for hundreds and hundreds of years. Think of all the wars. The Brits, the Brits were fighting with the French and the French were fighting with the Spanish, the Spanish Armada. You look, you look at all the different wars that were going on and then you see the previous century, World War I, World War II. And right now Europe is united has a, a higher GDP than the United States of America. Amazing. There has never been a time since 70 AD. 70 AD, Titus and the Roman legions destroyed Jerusalem and the Jews are dispersed throughout the world. And the scriptures that talk about the Jewish people, scholars for the last 2,000 years have said, oh no, these don't apply to Israel, they apply to the church. And there are still some knuckleheads who are still saying that. There has not been a time since 70 AD when Israel was a nation, and that occurred in 1948. There was not a time since 70 AD when Jerusalem was under the control of the Jewish people in Israel, and that occurred in 1968. There was not a time since 70 AD when the Jewish people were speaking the original language which has been totally restored, the Hebrew language which has never occurred in linguistics and language in all of history, and that has occurred in this previous generation. And there has never been a time with the Jewish people coming from the north and from the south and from the east and from the west, returning from the four corners, just as Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Jesus predicted, coming and returning to the promised land. And there's never been a time with the Jewish people in the promised land surrounded by more enemies who would like to annihilate them, genocide them, and drive them into the Mediterranean Sea. There has never been a time. And there has never been a time, I believe there has never been a time in history, like the times we live in, when Jesus talked about birth pangs, and he talked about earthquakes, and he talked about different types of, of, of disturbances and pestilences. There has never been a time where we have seen, we have seen unprecedented natural disasters, typhoons, hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, droughts, floods, wildfires, pestilence, disease. Even unbelievers, they're scratching their head, and when I'm talking to them, they're saying to me, Frank, what's going on? It, 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 you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon to see that there's something happening in our world of biblical prophetic proportions. Second Peter talks about the scoffers who will come in the last days and say, where is the promise of his coming? Well, I believe the promise of his coming is right at the door. And the signs are being fulfilled like never before all around us. Last thing. You see the wonderful words, it is done. Revelation 16, it is done. And you know what that's speaking about? It is done, and that is the wrath of God. The wrath of God has been poured out. Revelation chapter 16, you know what folks? Revelation 16, this is just about it. We're almost done. I mean, you say, whoa, what do you mean, Pastor Frank? You have Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 18. Revelation 7 and 18 talk about, and I'm going to talk to you about this next week, it talks about a political system and a religious system that's been with us from the beginning. And we're going to cover that. 
But, but the, the timeline, it's, it's, it's just about done. Revelation 19, Jesus comes back, destroys his enemies, sets up the kingdom. The wrath of God. God's judgment. It is done. I'll tell you something. That's an it is done that you don't want to be involved in. That, that's an it is done that, that, that it's, it's the judgment of God, the wrath of God. Judgment on Satan, judgment on the Antichrist, judgment on the false prophet, judgment on, on all the godlessness and the godless. I think you'd rather have, it is finished. It is finished. That's what he cried out when he was on the cross. You know what that's about? That's not about wrath. In fact, that's about grace. That's about love. That's about forgiveness. I mean, it is done in Revelation 16. That's about wrath. That's about judgment. That's about unforgiveness. That's about hell. It is finished. He took the wrath. So you have a choice. You can let him take the wrath, or you can take the wrath. And if you're going to take the wrath, good luck. Good luck. Because I'll tell you something, man, somebody had to pay the price. And you can try to pay it yourself, <laughs> Well, you can let him pay it. That's your choice. That's the choice of the human race. It is done. You know what's unique about the human race? Whatever religion they're involved in, even the atheists and agnostics, they all have a sense of sin. They all have a sense of sin. People try to hide it. They try to ignore it. They try to justify it. But they have a sense of sin. They have a sense that, you know what? I know the good. And I don't do it. And I know the evil, and sometimes I do it. There's something wrong. Every human being, and we have a choice. You can try to go it alone, and if you try to go it alone, that's what you experience. Or you can try to go it the way of the Lord, and you can take yourself to Jesus, and you can ask him to forgive you to be the Lord of your life and your Savior. And He will take it. He will take your sin upon Himself. And He will redeem you. I hope that's the way you'll go. And that's the decision you'll make. It is finished. And your sin can be finished. And you can have a relationship with God and receive in your heart the gift of eternal life. And no, and no. I'll tell you, I don't know quite how he did it. I was a young person who had no interest in him. But somehow he called me. Somehow he drew me. And when I heard the gospel message, I opened my heart to him, and he came in. He forgave me of my sins. He came and he dwelt me and began to live in me. And he gave me an assurance that if I was to die, I know, I know without a doubt I would go to be with him. Never worry about it. Never. Even in near times of death, never worry about it. Sometimes I even long for it. And that's only a miracle that he can do. You could have it your way, or you could have it his way. Ultimately, he wins in the end. Bow your heads, let's pray.
Thank you for your grace, Lord, and your mercy. Lord. We praise you, Lord. 
You are a great God and awesome God. Praise you.